So, we'll be talking about mining public data set using open source tools. But first, a few, few words about me. My name is Alex, and I'm from Seoul, South Korea, as you could guess. And um, originally, I'm from St. Petersburg, Russia. I graduated maths there many years ago. And um, I'm a co-organizer of Ledger's Tech Meetup in Seoul. So if you happen to travel there, please let me know. We can arrange something like this there in Seoul. And I'm also a committer and a PPMC member of Apache Zeppelin project, which I'm going to be mentioning later on. So please feel free to contact me later on. And I will put the slides online, so you don't really need to take pictures. You can just get the links from there. So I'm software engineer by training, and there are all types of software engineering out there. But today we're going to talk about a particular type, which is data engineering, I would say. So first, like, I don't really think I need to persuade you that these days data is important. So it is product or byproduct of many different things in our lives these days. And a lot of big and interesting and successful projects and companies were built purely on data. And I listed just some examples out here. And um, yeah, all those companies, despite they do stuff in, in real life or in internet, they actually uh, just data generating machines and they know how to operate those machines very well. So, the IoT is blank there because the subject of this talk, of, of this conference, one of the themes is IoT, and I don't know really clean winner in that area, like successful project build on IoT data, but I'm pretty sure there's gonna be some. There's gonna be another name with another logo soon. So, yeah, like the, um, I would love to see it there, and hopefully one of you guys can, can, can do that. So the, the little bit of the context for this is um, like size of the data is growing and, and size of the public data is constantly growing. There are more and more data available out there and there's going to be even more in a year or so and, and you can't stop that. So you better master it right now and jump on the train earlier than be later on. And um, so there's going to be more and more data products. So it's basically anything based on data and be that research or a company or actual service. And uh, with this, number of tools available to crunch the data is also growing. That's why it's kind of sometimes hard to orient yourself in that landscape. And one of the goals of my talk was kind of to give you my experience. I spent last two years being a data engineer in a small startup company in Seoul, South Korea. And I've been, so I gained some experience that help me to, to pick the right tool for the right job. And um, I hope I can share that with everyone. So in next year, data analytics gig uh, or freelance job or actually data job, you can, you can use this knowledge. So the, more, the main point for me is like public data means open opportunity. It's public, it's out there, it's open. It's up to you to go and pick that. And if you don't want to do that, that's fine. But um, I'm pretty sure there's going to be more people wanting to exercise that opportunity. So that's why three things that are important on that way are what are the data sets available, what are the tools, and what is the approach. Uh, so we'll go briefly through all of that, and we start with data sets. And there are really a lot of open and public data sets out there. I just listed like kind of some. But uh, it was not an intention, intention to have a wiki page here with all the links. You can pretty much find that. But there are some I find particularly interesting. And I'm going to be talking about two examples. Uh, first is GitHub Archive. So GitHub, like I'm pretty sure all you know, guys, all you guys know the GitHub as a company. And I think they did a great job pushing it further. Uh, and opening the public user activity logs and putting it the, out there on Google Cloud so you can just download that and, and use it. It's basically logs about 10 billion, so they've got 10 million users and each action of the user on their website actually generate a log and they not just monetize it as other companies do. And of course they do, they, they also share it, so it's available. You can try doing that too. And, uh, 
that's definitely some opportunities out there. And people exercise those opportunities, and GitHub fosters that. They host annually data analytics challenge, like for two or three years in a row, and those are some examples of projects built using that data. So it's basically searching the commit to logo messages for particular sentiments and list them. And you can see people do all type of stuff, and yeah, you can pick some interesting ones and may you make your day a little bit better by reading those things. Or one of the useful ones, and actually the author of that one is from Seoul, so it's very, so I happen to know him. It's project uh, code style conventions, analyze. So next time you're going to argue with your colleagues whether you should use your tabs or spaces for indention or whether it's break it on this line or that line, you can move on from, well, that's like your opinion and you to actually a data-driven approach and say, hey, of this language, this number of projects use this convention, so we should be using that. That's a valid data point. So that's, that, I find something, I find that useful myself. So, and another recent one is kind of live dashboard on the GitHub. So of course GitHub internally have more advanced things like that, but you kind of from outside can also sneak peek at what's going on on their platform which is one of the biggest hosting for open software out there. So it's quite interesting to have a sneak peek and see all those types of things going on and number of them per second and there's a pull request, commands and everything. And of course there are opportunities for some visualizations out there. So this is an example of uh, repository activity by language. I'm not sure, yeah, it's not like contrast enough, but there is a link. So you can check, those are basically repositories of the programming languages, like Python, Ruby, and others, and how active they are, number of comments. Uh, so that was one example. Another one I find really fruitful, that data set I really love, is Common Crawl. So have you guys ever heard about that one? Anybody? Yeah, see, that's the problem. The, that's what one of the goals of this talk, to raise the awareness of this awesome stuff laying out there. So it's basically a crawl of the internet. Of course, fraction of it, but quite substantial. So it's the same raw material this Google is built up on. So those guys, uh, it's uh, from Factuals. Factuals is a small company, uh, it's actually not small, but company in California. By one of the early Google employees, he left, started this company, and what he did, he was monetizing the structured data. So basically, whenever you want to know the list of top schools in the US ranked by state, or anything, things like that, you're gonna go to them and buy that, and they sell an API, a data, and everything for data-driven journalism. So it's kind of a big thing. But they wanted to contribute back to the community, so they started this nonprofit foundation called Open uh, Common Crawl. So they basically crawl the internet and put it out there in the public monthly. And it's about 2 billion URLs per month for the last maybe three years. And each month it's about 150 terabytes of compressed data set. And it's just all the resources, you know, like all the web, the website they crawl, all the resources from the website saved in particular work format, which is a standard tool for um, web archive. The same tools Internet Archive use to build their Wayback machine, to, to build all the goodies that they do. So that's kind of, they play nice in the ecosystem, and that's very fruitful. There are many things you can do with that. One of the example of the projects built on top of that I wanted to highlight is by Ilya from California, and that's a search index on top of that data set. So you can search the URLs that have been crawled and figure out whether your favorite website or what type of website are there in the crawl. And it's basically a huge B3 index of the URL sitting on the Amazon S3 and has a nice web API and it's completely open source. You can play with that. It's Python based and you can improve or deploy your own. So, And it's not only industry project, it's academia project as well. Every year, the number of academia papers based on this data set is growing, and this is an example of uh, using that data set to take the actual language, to build the language models for mm, like translation or natural language uh, processing things. So they just take it and convert to Ngram model and put it out there. And before that, if you wanted to do research in that area, you got to be part of the university, which pays Google to get access to their one trillion data set of Ngrams they collected from the web. But not anymore. You, as just I mean, an independent individual, can go download that and play with it. And those guys publish the data set as well. So it's not only the crawl, it's all types of derivatives based on the crawl like URL index and uh, 
Landgram language model for different languages, it's not just English. So it's quite awesome. And quite and then another recent project I found. So actually somebody's being building a web search engine using that data. It looks a little bit familiar, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not sure how legal is that. But they just started. So it's a good time to jump on. So if somehow you are interested in large scale search engines and stuff, you don't need to apply for a work in big company. You can just take that and you know play it on your own and build something useful. So it's totally up to you, and that's awesome. That was never like that before. You don't need to run the crawl on your own. And running a crawl is a hard job. So there have been a lot of companies built on how to do that, and now it's open, so you can just go pick and, and use that. So those are the data sets. Now a few tools that um, we're going to be using to, to crunch the data. And there are plenty of tools out there. And there are, like I try to classify them a little bit, and there are generic ones, which is beloved grep and all kind of programming languages with the libraries you can use. And that's all good, but usually that's hard to scale beyond one machine or type of data you want to crunch. Then there are all this high performance stuff and uh, low level stuff, Hadoop for that matter. Those are like hard to, to use tools, but they do the job and um, you're going to spend a lot of time learning them or getting access to the cluster of machines which can do the thing. But recently, there's been a plethora of tools which I call here new and scalable, and um, those are going to be the tools we're going to talk about. And I pick some of them I find really useful, and al almost all of them happen to be under Apache Software Foundation. So at this point, I wanted to ask how many of you guys know about Apache Software Foundation? Okay, there are a few hands, but so if I may push it further, like what exactly do you know about that foundation? So, like, can anybody share? Yeah, I've been using Tomcat for pretty long now. Right. Uh, I've heard about Spark and Kafka. Great, great. So there's like web stuff there, right? Um, anything else? My yes, libraries. Mm -hmm. Many projects, uh, open source projects, uh, mm -hmm. based on their um, uh, license. Mm -hmm. Based on Apache license, right, right. That's actually good. That's actually much better than better answers that I usually get when I ask this question. So that's great. I wanted to just to highlight some. The, the the main point is actually not one project. It's not just Apache web server anymore, and just not web stuff. So there's more than 200 projects out there. They're all unified, um, of course, by the license they use, which is like business friendly license, and uh, there are more than three. I think it's about 3,000 people like deeply involved into the foundation. And um, it's also the foundation shares the particular view on how to build the software in an open and collaborative way. And uh, I spent last year working on the project, different projects under Apache, and I wanted to say that uh, like since then I consider actually that's the best way to build software. So I can't encourage more to go check it out and check those keywords that I highlighted. That's something really interesting going on there, and we definitely can learn from that uh, in many, many ways. So anyway, somehow Apache recently become, like after Hadoop, it become a home for so many data analytics stuff. So we're going to pick just some of that and um, briefly cover that. So and the, those are the things I wanted to list here. And um, we go briefly through each of them, and uh, I'll describe a little bit of experience using them. Um, and they play nicely together and constitute a stack of tools you can use for basically any data analytics gig. And they are easy to learn, in my experience, and generic enough for multiple projects. So, although don't mistake, they're not very simple. But the difference with previous generation is that it's much easier to get started and learn that. So the first one is kind of Spark, and it has this star there. So it's actually a kind of a star project. It's very popular. It's tremendously growing. has more than 1,000 contributors all over the world these days. It started uh, like in, even before 2010, actually, as a research center in Berkeley University by a few students and a uh, celebrity professor. So. They're great guys, very smart. They built it open source from scratch, but eventually they joined the Apache Foundation. They donated the project, and uh, since then it grew tremendously. It got uh, 
it attracted a lot of traction online. So what it does, it basically provides you a REPL interface and the API in multiple languages uh, to, to a new abstraction, like kind of distributed array sitting on a cluster of machines that you can go through and iterate. So um, yeah, that's the, like a really small example of Spark program, and that's what I mean by them being easy to get started with. This is hello. This is like hello world of big data, and it's just counting the words in, in a huge array. And there's a lot of there's much more stuff than that. There's graph processing libraries and machine learning and SQL. So so there's a lot of stuff going on there, and um, definitely worth learning a little bit about that if you want to be in data analytics field. The next one is Apache Zeppelin. That's the project I'm involved in. It's kind of GUI style, a notebook which plays nicely on top of different backend processing systems, be that Spark or anything else. So it's quite easy to set up. It looks like this. So you can build interactive visualization using that. And it find, I find it really helpful to get started with a new project and build build intuition around data, play with that, and eventually build a data product on top of that. So it, it's been a while in development and went through a few phases in this internal prototypes, but eventually, so and it was open source from scratch. No, no, it, there were closed source product before, but it was open source as a Spark from, as a Zeppelin from scratch, and recently joined Apache Foundation, like been one year and through three major releases. So it gets attraction, and it's about like fr it grew from two contributors to more than seventy all over the world, and you can build stuff like that there with the simple queries over distributed data sets. So it's quite nice, and it has pluggable interpreters that you can use not only Spark but many other things. We're not <laughs> going to be talking about them here, but you've got a lot of power there. So next one is Wirebase. So it's basically a library built by University of Waterloo in Canada, a professor there. So it helps you to work with uh, crawl and archive data and gives really nice API. As you can see, those uh, examples of counting top level domains in the crawl of uh, pages that have 400 status returns. So you don't need to filter and do low level stuff. You can just use this one. So that's, that's a cool project. One more tool is this Juju by guys from Canonical. As um, they call it service modeling at scale, but it's a fancy way of saying like deploy, deployment and configuration automation tool, which also plays nicely with the whole the ecosystem. So it got integration with everything you're going to be needing to go to scale. And that's an example of how you will be getting started with that tool. So the seven lines of like shell, you're going to get the tool and the cluster of seven node machines with the distributed file system and resource manager and the whole Spark thing and Zeppelin on top of that. So it's pretty simple. And if you want to add more machines, you're going to be just running the last command and saying n like 400 or n 4000. You're going to be adding more machines and scaling it out. So the approach to use this tool on scale and budget looks like that. So you're going to be starting with a Friday night experiment and prototyping your solution on a single laptop on Friday night. And then um, if you verify your hypothesis and it works well, you're going to be using it on a fraction of the data. It's like maybe hundreds of machines to estimate the cost. Because if you want to go to scale, you're going to be needing much more machines to process, for example, a crawl of uh, I know, terabytes or petabytes eventually. So, and if that works out, you can go to scale. And the nice thing about it, you can use still the same tools to be able to do that, the tools that I listed before. And you wrote your software once, it runs in every situation out there. So that's something different. Before that, you were writing software every time you want to go for the next line here and not anymore. So it, I find it very useful value proposition of this stack of tools. So, and then again, it's quite easy to get started with them. So they were designed for that. So that's, that's like a penated stack I was about to share with you with like some takeaways here. So there are plenty of data and plenty of tools and a lot of open opportunities. So just it's up to you whether you want to start exploring them. And I want to encourage you, please do. Please do. So with that being said, 
thank you, and I will be happy to answer some questions. <laughs> Any questions? Uh -huh. That's a good question. So the question was, well, there are many other tools which loop like in the area where Zeppelin is, like kind of uh, GUI tools in browser to be able to interact with data. And we've got that question a lot. And um, they're comparable, but the focus of IPython and Jupyter, for example, is uh, be very generic. Like they cover all the cases, and that's fine. But the goal of Zeppelin is to cover like large-scale cluster computing cases in particular, and it has smooth workflow working with those things. So if you ever set up like Spark, iSpark kernel for IPython, it takes some time. It's doable, of course, and uh, but with this Zeppelin, it just works, and it's easy to add a cluster there, and uh, it's just simpler to use. So I'm pretty sure that area is big enough to have multiple projects going on there, and there are really different people using those tools. For example, IPython is pushing scientific community. Uh, Zeppelin is more targeted to engineers, to industry community, who are going to data science. So I think that's, that's a big enough area to have multiple projects. And uh, all of them are doing well, and uh, I don't think there is like direct competition, so one of them like kill another. No, I think they're going to be living and, and serving their purposes. Any other questions? Yeah. I'm a C++ programmer and just, um, I'm just trying to develop some sense of big data. Uh -huh. So what would your advice be for someone who, mm -hmm. who works with data but not as a data scientist? Mm -hmm. How do I get into this field? So what can I start on? And right. Right. How did you do it yourself? Uh -huh. that's, that's a good question. If you're coming from uh, industry background with a kind of more lower level stuff and you're getting into data analytics, how do you get started? So usually, like, if you know C++, you kind of know Java in, in a way, maybe in a better way, but you do. So it's not hard to get that one. And as soon as you understand Java, all this stack I was talking about, except maybe Juju, is in Java or Scala. And Scala is kind of like functional Java, but so, so it's kind of easy to get started with those tools coming from background like you. And... Uh, yeah, I would encourage checking out Spark. It has a nice API for Java and, and Scala. And uh, from there, you can check all types of references. And uh, yeah, I think that's that's the good path. So besides the tool itself, uh -huh. um, what about the mindset? Like, how do you approach data? How, how do I train on that? <laughs> right, so that's actually quite a big question. And um, I would be happy to give you some, to share my thinking about that, maybe after the session. But there are plenty of uh, online courses, and that's what I do myself, like actually go through many of them. So check that out, and there are some really good ones focusing on like more math aspect or more uh, like engineering aspect, depending on what you want to. So, so uh, we'll take one last question. I'd be around so we can talk after <laughs> the session. So please go. Actually, I'm working on an automated system which will automatically grade your essays. Mm -hmm. So what I'm having problem is that I, like, I'm running it on my local machine mm -hmm. and I'm grading it using uh, sparse vectors. Uh -huh. So it is running out of memory because I don't have that much memory. Right. So what kind of servers, like, I'm a student, so like budget server would you recommend for me? So uh, that's a good question. Uh, so, like, if data doesn't fit, I mean, if data fits the machine, but processing does not, so you got to use more machine and the system that plays nicely with more machines. And in my experience, Spark is something you can easily uh, get started with, and it is able to represent sparse data. So you basically can read it in the internal form of sparse representation in Spark with one or two commands, and then go from there. And Spark will take care of distributing it on the cluster of machines, and that's the best part of it. So maybe you can just manually spin up two or three machines with the Spark cluster on it, and then try read that data and see if uh, the cluster eventually has enough memory to have that sparse representation. So I would do something like that. Um. Okay. Thank you so much, Alexander. So for those that want to you know, follow your tutorials or get more information about right. this, how can they get more out of your, or what have you what you've just presented? So, so I definitely will publish those slides, but um, 
I like I generally hang around the uh, Zeppelin mailing list, so if you can stop by and say, hey, like I met it there or something, uh, I will be happy to answer questions. There's also like on a GitHub or Twitter, you can contact me and I'll be happy to answer more questions. And I think I'll be around after that talk so we can talk a little bit more, uh, not taking the schedule time. Thank you so much. So thank you, Alexander. Sure. Thank you, thank you so much.